It's an old statement, but I think it bears a significant amount of truth. History is written by the victors. I'm sure you've all heard that maxim before in some way or other. It explains, for example, that although you know I'm an historian by, by trade, there's a significant absence in my knowledge around the year 1776. Around until 1805, there's a significant lack of knowledge because in my country where I come from, we don't tend to learn about the defeats, significant or insignificant as they may have been. In Britain, we tend not to spend quite so much time on the American Revolution as we may do so on, for example, the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 when we really handed it to the French. Because we prefer, as a culture, the things that glorify our forefathers. And it's true, however you want to look at it, that history tends to be recorded by the victors. It's, it's the reason why when you read of many of the original sources, not just the books about them that you read in school or in college, but if you go back to the actual original sources, specifically the ancient sources, so if you're reading the Roman accounts, for example, or the Grecian accounts of victories, they didn't just win, all right? It's more than that. The losers are rewritten as evil, as wicked, as cowardly, as debauched and debased and vile. It's not just enough to win. You have to be the good guys when you're doing it. Because the victors, they don't simply want to be the, the winners. They want to be the righteous winners, the righteous victors. Thus, as I mentioned, the Battle of Waterloo, the Napoleonic Wars. If you read the English newspapers and tabloids at that time, the French were barbaric and the English were the saviors of civilization. It wasn't just a battle. It wasn't just a war. It was a moral conflict over the fiber of the nation and perhaps the fiber of the West. And such legacies continue because the English wrote most of the books about the victory. And they used that victory not simply to demonstrate moral and military superiority, but to demonstrate also God's favor in their conquest. God is with us. Therefore, we know we're right. And the proof is in the pudding. We won. Of course, as we're about to see in the next number of months as we go through the book of Judges, the mantra, true as it may be in some aspects, that history is written by the winners, struggles to remain in force when we come to the book of Judges. As we begin our study through Judges, the first chapter opens, as you may expect, from a book written by the victors. There are victories galore. There is victory and after victory after victory. The evil peoples in the land, they're smited, they're smoted, they're defeated and repelled in battle time and again. And it thrives and heaves with the sense of victory and inevitability. And at the climax of the first half of the chapter, we're going to see this vision of bounty, this vision of prosperity, this vision of hope, of what life is going to be like when they live in the land that they conquered under the reign of Yahweh, their God, when they're obedient under the rule of God. But by the time we get to the end of our third section this morning, you're going to see and you're going to smell treachery in the air. And what's unique or different, at least, about this book of Judges is that though it is indeed written by the victors, by the Israelites, we'll see even by verse 26 of the first chapter, this is not a bard's ballad of ebullience, which simply means it's not a story of victory. It's not going to be a book like other history books explaining the victories and demeaning the enemies, what we're going to see is a hint of the things to come, things that bode very ill for these very victors. And yet, in a beautiful and wonderful, ironic twist of theological simplicity, these same things that bode ill for the victors 
are the very same thing that demonstrates the holiness and the justice of Israel's God. Ultimately, the book of Judges, contrary to what we might first immediately think, is not a book about the Israelites versus the Canaanites. It's really a book about Israel versus Israel's God, about Israel's disobedient attitude to Yahweh and to the covenant that they had made. But it all begins, to set the scene, it all begins with this startling vision of what could have been. So turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 1. There should be a, a Bible in the pew in front of you. You have our app, NBC app. You can use that as well. If you don't happen to own a Bible, there's Bibles at the back. As you leave this morning, take one and learn about this God who is holy, who has and that demands justice, but also has planned a way for those of us who have been unable to keep his holiness and his standards of justice, which is all of us. So I'm going to read from Judges chapter 1 this morning, and we'll read from the, start reading from verse 1. We'll read the first 10 verses. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? The Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled. And they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. And afterwards the men of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country in the Negev and in the lowland. And Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba. And they defeated Sheshai and Achaman and Talmai. So the first lesson we learn from the book of Judges is this. Our obedience rests in trusting God's power. Our obedience rests in trusting God's power. And we begin the book by remem remembering or being reminded that the second great leader of the Israelite nation, Joshua, has died. If you remember, he was the leader who oversaw uh, the, the conquest of, of the land of Canaan after the death of Moses. He replaced Moses. But it was also under Joshua that the people divided the land out among themselves. The land was allotted to the different tribes. And though the land was entered during Joshua's reign, it would fall to the subsequent tribes themselves to secure their own allotment. The settlement would not happen under his reign. The settlement, as we saw last week, remained to be completed. And at his death, what is rather surprising is the significance of what Israel does next. Look down on verse 1 and 2 again. What do you see? You see that rather than electing a new leader post-haste, because Joshua apparently hadn't groomed a new leader the same way Moses had groomed Joshua, what they did was they immediately went to Yahweh and said, now what do we do? That's a good sign. It shows perhaps Israel has learned something under this leader and learned something about their own proclivity and their own need to rest on Yahweh. And so we're not, it doesn't explain how. It's probably the umim and thumim, the, the way the Israelites found out God's will in certain difficult circumstances. We don't know how they did it, but they found out that God had selected Judah as the tribe to lead the conquest of the land. The tribe of Judah had the privilege of the initial fighting. 
Now, it should be understood, but just to be, just to be clear, this is not one guy. It was one guy way back in the day, but it is all the descendants of Judah who are the tribe of Judah. So God is speaking of Judah as a person, understanding that it's the tribe of Judah. It's not one man, as we're about to see, taking on 10,000 Canaanites. It's the tribal name from the tribe, the people who descended from the real person who was named Judah. And so this tribe of Judah, in accordance with God's command, is given the responsibility to go and defeat the Canaanites that they first encounter. And I suspect that God chose Judah for a very clear and very important purpose. If you remember, we haven't covered it since I've been here, but way back at the end of Genesis, the forefather of Israel has a very clear prophecy that he gives concerning each of his sons. And the one he gives to Jake, or to, sorry, to, to Judah is that he will have the enemies of the peoples by the throat. That's a loose translation. He will rule over them. And his brothers will praise him. And so it makes sense here now, all these centuries later, that Judah is earmarked as the leader of the twelve as the warrior of the 12. And so Judah takes the lead at God's command. But notice that they don't go alone. You'll see that if you look down in verse three, they make a deal with their brother, the Simeonites, of whom they have particularly close kin because they share not only the same father, but the same mother. And that's a whole nother story for another time, another narrative for another time. But this is the tribe that was descended from the name of the son of Jacob, Simeon. So the Judahites and the Simeonites, they agree that right now the Simeonites will go and fight with Judah, and in return, when the Simeonites go to take over their allotted land, the Judahites will assist them. These tribes, of course, it's more than simply just kinship, because they're all related as the descendants of Jacob, but there's more to it because locationally, they're right side by side. In the, in, the, in the nation of Israel. Now, we may have a slide, we may not have a slide, I'm not sure. If we do, it'll show up. If not, I apologize, that's my fault. But there's a slide. At the very bottom left-hand corner of the slide, you see Judah and Simeon. So it makes sense that they fight together. It makes sense that they go into the land together. It's a good faith gesture and a promise of help. And the leaders of the tribe of Simeon, they agree. And together, they dressed for war, and they marched to face the Canaanites. And the Canaanites, understanding and hearing all the rumors and all the legends of what happened to Jericho, what happened to Egypt, they array for battle. And they seem to get together a conglomeration of peoples, and about 10,000 of them array. And the Canaanites array in a vast force to halt the march of these invaders. But the question then becomes an ethical one. It doesn't it? It's quite challenging because we have to ask, is it fair that God has promised the land that belongs to the Canaanites to this invading force? How can it be fair or how can it be right for God to demand the expulsion of the Canaanites and not even just their expulsion, but their eradication from the land? After all, they're there. It's evidently their land. It's the Israelites who are the invading forces. Is this fair? It's their land, right? Well, no, actually. It's not the land that belongs to the Canaanites. And that's a critical point we have to understand. Remember when we studied Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 last year? God is the creator over all things. This is all God's creation to give to whomever he pleases. Every shoreline, every throne, every mountain range, every plateau, it's all Yahweh's. It's all God's. And he has stated that due to the idolatry and the violence of the Canaanite peoples who were also God's property, they're no longer welcome in this land. You might think of the, the phrase, a landlord. As the landlord, the creator has every right to expel these wicked inhabitants, these, these breaking the law tenants. And just to be very clear, 
God applies the same criteria to his own people, and when they fall short of his holiness, he does the exact same thing to them. He kicks them out of the land as punishment for their idolatry and their wickedness. So the Canaanites, by refusing to leave and by arraying themselves in war against the Israelites, they're not simply fighting against an invading force. They're standing against the landlord. They're standing against the warrior God. And hence, judgment is required. And I'm fully aware this morning there'll be people present who when thinking about this in terms of real people really suffering, and these are real people and they do really suffer, it's difficult to grasp and it's uncomfortable. But we have to turn back to the larger reality. All the way back in Genesis 3, we saw that mankind as a whole, that includes you and I, declared war on God. The Canaanites are not innocent butterflies. They are a people who were at war with God. Literally, they're standing in front of God's people brandishing their swords. The image that we read of these Canaanite peoples and we know from extra biblical sources about their nature, their attitude, their world, their culture is not a nice peace-loving society. Just look, for example, at what this particular king in verse Seven has done to 70 other kings. These people are wicked. They're violent. They're worshiping false gods in ways that are deplorable, depraved, and frankly, demonic. And God, in sending his people into the land, is acting as the landlord. He's punishing sin. He's acting justly. This is Yahweh's justice. Because sin deserves punishment. Our series here in the book of Judges, it's entitled The Justice of Yahweh. And and God's eternal laws of holiness have been intentionally, grievously, repeatedly, and violently opposed by the sinfulness of humanity. And God demonstrates in the judges the universal principle that God will deal with with sin. He will be patient for many, many years, but he will deal with sin. Dear friend, this morning you need to realize that you too are at war with God. And while God no longer commands violence in the hand of his followers, and we'll see why in a little moment, while it is true that the nature has changed of the covenant, there will still be justice. It won't come from me, and it won't come from an army of Christians. It will come from God himself, and that is infinitely more terrifying. Your sin will be presented before you, and it will be a litany of acts of war against God's holiness so compelling that before his throne you will condemn yourself and you will acknowledge, I am guilty. And that moment will be terrifying, but it will be just. But it doesn't have to be that way because God has been crafting a plan that through the line of Judah, there would come a king who would reign for eternity. Just as Judah went to war against the enemies of God, Jesus, God's king, went to war against the even greater enemies of God and the reign of God. He went to war against Satan, against sin, against death. And on the cross, he sent every one of them to flight. He defeated every single one of them. He was victorious, and because of his victory, there is salvation for all who believe. He would come and he would suffer on the cross so that you don't have to, dear friend. He would take your place, standing, hanging from the cross, 
feeling the full wrath of the Father so that you get to stand before God and be declared innocent. This means that by trusting Christ, submitting to him entirely, and worshiping him, repenting of your sinful, warlike rebellion, and instead you can come to peace with God, and instead of calling God the God who is out there that we hate, we can come and say, Father. You can be saved from the justice, the right wrath of God, and enjoy the grace and peace that Christ has won for you by fighting a war you will never win on your own. Only by faith in Christ can you lay your weapons down, and only by faith in Christ can you know true peace and true rest. This morning, let me plead with you, hear the gospel that Christ died for you, and come to faith. Speak with someone around you. Talk with them. Share with them. If you're listening online, send us an email. Talk to someone in a local church near you. This is too important to simply ignore. We we implore you to speak. We would be delighted to show you this Christ who became sin to free you from your sin. God is just. And so we see that he gives Judah and Simeon the victory. The army of 10,000 was defeated at Bezek. We're not totally sure who the Perizzites are. They could be another group of people like, like the Canaanites, or it could be, uh, the word is a little bit confusing to grasp, but it could simply be the villagers. So you have the city dwellers and the villagers uniting together. We're not quite sure. The point is, everyone who stands against God at this battlefield is defeated. And Christian, it should be obvious, but just to clarify, we aren't soldiers in this way as Israel was. We aren't living under the type of government that Israel was for one. Israel was a theocracy. We are not. We are a people gathered from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We are not one people gathered in one land. So we aren't fighters against other flesh, but nevertheless, Christian, we are warriors We are fighters. We fight against things not of this world. We fight against our own sinful desires. We fight against the prince and power of the air and the power of our our God who indwells us by his spirit. We are to be as ruthless and as valiant and as intentional in our warfare as Judah was, seeking help from those who were able to help us for sure, but nevertheless, we are not to shirk from the conquest. Because just like the Canaanites, our enemies, which is Satan and sin, they seek to destroy us. There's no bartering. There's no compromise. We must be vigilant, and victory only comes through Christ. Whether it's victory over lust and pornography, whether it's victory over anger and frustration, whether it's victory over self-worship and self-obsessedness, whether it's victory over gossip or greed or resentment or bitterness or jealousy, whatever it is, we must overcome that enemy in the power of Christ by the indwelling of his spirit. That involves warfare. That involves girding our loins with Scripture. It involves the helmet of truth. It involves the belt. It involves the sword. It involves the shield. It involves being girded for war, Christian. The only hope, the only strength, the only confidence that we can have is the Spirit who indwells us. And when we think about it in those terms we come to realize the truth that our obedience rests in trusting the power of God who dwells within us for the purpose of giving us victory. God enables us to fight, and obedience is worth it because it honors God, and it's also in our best interest. We are called to obey and we are expected to obey because we have the Spirit of Christ in us who empowers us. And we know God who is our Father and he has good intentions for us grounded in his love. Christian, when we sin, therefore what we are doing is we are declaring that we do not trust in God's goodness towards us. 
when we say to him, we don't want your rule over our lives, that's when we end up sinning, isn't it? We trust the lie that we can't hold out anymore. The temptation is too strong. And we deny the power of the Spirit who can enable us to taste victory. Just look at the Canaanites. Trusting in ourselves leads to very, very bad places. Let the example of Judah encourage you. We can obey Christ in the hardest, most difficult, most frightening trials if we trust the power of God who indwells us. We can taste victory. He has promised to empower us and he has promised to be with us in the temptations, in the conflict. So cling to that, Christian, and be obedient in his power. It wasn't just a victory, it was a rout, we read in Judges 1. And they not only defeat the enemy, but they capture the king who had fled, and they punish him severely. And to our modern sensitive ears, this sounds very barbaric, doesn't it? It's rather gruesome. It's a little bit comical. That's so far removed, but it is a bit bizarre. Just think about all the things that you use your big toes for. Think about how you use your thumb. Just think about opening a bottle of water without your thumb. What is interesting and what is important to note is that Adonai Bezek, he sees this justice as his just reward. He does not decry God as being unkind or unfair. He says, I did it to these 70 people. It's only fair that my turn has come. Quite a, a negative outlook on life, but nevertheless, that's his interpretation of the events as they unfold. But we must be very careful not to speak into this context our own cultural norms. These are people who are living under the rules of their times. Whatever we might think about those rules, they're products of their time. And nevertheless, it is just worthwhile noticing that God neither commands nor commends this action. It is simply recorded as this is what the Judaites did. The king accepted it, and it's what happened. But there is a logic to what they did. If you want to get get into the nitty-gritty details, there's a logic to it. You can't wield a sword if you have no thumb. You cannot stand and have the required swiftness of foot and footwork for battle if you have no big toes. They provide stability. They provide movement and dexterity. It's a humiliating demonstration, a visible reminder of defeat, and it renders Adonai Bezek useless on the battlefield. But we also know that in this ancient, pra- this ancient world, the practice of kingship was to go to a war in the season. And so what the Judahites have effectively done whilst preserving the life of Adonai Bezek is they've basically deformed him, making him effectively ineligible or at least useless as an opponent king. He goes back to Jerusalem humbled, weakened. He not only lost the battle, but in a sense, he loses his kingship. And like a captured animal, he's brought to Jerusalem where he eventually dies. His defeat complete. And the next massive thing we read about is the capture of Jerusalem. And we don't know if they take the whole fortification or not. We're not entirely sure. But it's a huge signpost for us right now at this moment. If you're going through the the text and scripture chronologically, it's just another city they capture. But for those of us who have the whole canon, we know that Jerusalem is a significant victory. It's a significant conquest. But right now, we simply read that the Israelites, the Judahites, they capture it and they put it to the sword. And the violence continues as they went into the hill country and there they defeat three more tribes of Shishai, Achaman, and Talmai. By the hand of God, the people were, were, were victorious. Their obedience rested in God giving them the victory. The second lesson we see as we move on in Judges 1 is that our provision rests in trusting God's faithfulness. Our provision rests in trusting God's faithfulness. Let's read from chapter 1, verse 11. From there... They went against the inhabitants of Debir, 
The name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, and they gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing. Since you have set me in the land of the Negev, give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. And we'll stop there and spend some time on these verses. So the war continues, and the army marches southwest of Hebron to take the Canaanite royal city of Debir. It's a royal city of the Canaanites. And we're introduced to this soldier named Caleb. And if you've read the book of Joshua, that name is very important. You may remember Caleb as being one of the spies who scouted out the land many decades prior to this moment. And he was one of only two spies who answered that even though the people there were were scary, were large, were, were armed for battle, in his mind they were giants, he was one of only two that said, but God will still give us the victory, so let us march. For that faith, he was promised the land, this this section of the land called Hebron. And now here, as a significantly older man, almost able to taste his inheritance at long last, after 40 years of walking in the wilderness, he seeks a warrior like he had once been, faithful and courageous. And to sweeten the deal, he offers that conqueror his own daughter, Aksa. Now, we have to remember that in the ancient world, again, a product of their time, the Israelites are acting in accordance with the world they lived in. Women were simply seen as pawns. They, they brokered power. They brought wealth with their dowry. Marriage was significantly less for love and more about survival, more about family politics, and more about wealth. And so the one who marries Aksa would be marrying into a family of great renown. Remember, Caleb is one of two. He's the only one left at this point who's seen all the stuff back then. The rest of the generation died out. Even Joshua is dead at this point. He's a man who's known for worshiping Yahweh righteously. He's a man of courage, a man who has firsthand experience of the mighty works of what God can do. And so not only would you be marrying into a, a, a family of great renown, he would also be wealthy. And therefore, when he offers Aksa, he's promising to the conqueror a great dowry, a great inheritance, a great financial boon. But as we shall see, Aksa herself is no fairy. She's quite an amazing woman. Nevertheless, the man who responds to this challenge and this promise is none other than Othniel, and most likely his clan. He didn't do it in his own, most likely, but his clan fought with him. And therefore, as the leader of the clan, Aksa would be his. And she was presented to him immediately by an an excited Caleb. And immediately, she gives sound advice to her husband-to-be. She says, ask for a field as part of our dowry. When Caleb then asks what she wants as a bridal gift because of his generosity in the moment, he finally receiving his inheritance, she asked for springs because after all, what use is a field, what use is land if nothing can grow on it? So she asks for springs of water. Now this sounds pretty logical and pretty normal, but this is not a place for her to go and wash. What she's asking for is significantly larger because the city they just conquered is called Debir. It's about eight and a half miles southwest of where they were. And the water supply for that system had two springs, the north and the, the upper and the southern, upper and lower springs, that ensured that the city was able to drink and survive through the hot, dry season. So what Aksa has effectively asked for is the city of Debir, because he, who, he or she who holds the water holds the city. So Caleb gets this plot of land, and then she enlarges it significantly by receiving, most likely, receiving this huge city. That's quite a dowry. 
Othniel comes out of this deal very, very well with his new bride. And there's a reason why we're spending so much time considering this. Because Caleb, who had faith in God from years ago, he's finally blessed with the fulfillment of the promise of the land. He's now sharing the abundance of this gift with others. Caleb, though, through all the wilderness years of wandering, watching his fellow Israelites fail time and time and time again, he continued to believe and trust God would give him this promise. It was more than he imagined, and his daughter was given this lavish gift to demonstrate not his love for his daughter, but his love for God. He trusted in God's faithfulness, and God proved himself faithful to Caleb. Othniel and Aksa benefited from Caleb's faith in Yahweh. And so this little section which marks the beginning of the book of Judges, it ends positively, doesn't it? We have this amazing vision of blessing. There's victory after victory. There's marriage. There's the taking of the land as God had promised. There's fertility assumed in the springs and in the field and in the marriage. Everything that God had promised, it seems to be being fulfilled. And this little microcosm of this story of Othniel and Aksa is just a snapshot of what life will be like when Yahweh rules over the land of Canaan. Prosperity, bountiful joy. God has proven himself faithful. And the vision we get is one of fullness. And it's wonderful and it's good. Now, Christian, let's be very clear. There's no correlation to you and I today. Caleb was given a very distinct promise by Moses that this land would be his. You and I, we don't get that promise. So that idea that God promised you a diamond ring or a new car or a new pay rise, let's squelch that. Nevertheless, we are given promises. God has promised to give us an eternal inheritance for those of us who believe. Many of us get jealous about petty, paltry things like this, not because our vision is too big and our eyes are too greedy, but because our vision is too small. God has promised us land in which we can walk upon streets that are paved with gold. Think about the wealth of that city. We have a promised eternal inheritance that moth and rust cannot destroy. For those out there who are crying out and begging for their best life now, they're insane because their vision is far too small. God has not promised us silly things like fancy cars and nice houses. Those gifts will die, they will corrode, they will rust, they will be replaced. Unbelieving friend or deceived brother and sister, God has not promised you health, wealth, and your wildest dreams in this life. Those visions are too small. What God has promised us <clears throat> is nothing short of himself. Everything. Christ is the spring of God's favor, the eternal spring of God's favor. He is the gift that will never die. And in him, through faith, all the promises that God has made will be ours to inherit and to receive. He has promised us eternity with himself, the great king in his presence, sitting at his table. Salvation, security, peace with himself. Everlasting life, adoption into his family. But just like Caleb, there, there will be wilderness years. There will be years wandering and waiting. So let us be like Caleb, waiting with hope and faith, trusting in God, that our provision rests in his faithfulness, not in our desperation. Our faith leads to obedience, and our obedience leads to further trust in him. So, Christian, let us remind ourselves of who God is, what he has already done for us, and let us set our gaze upon the things above so that we are preparing to receive the inheritance that is indeed ours. He has promised it, and he will indeed do it. So our provision rests in trusting God's faithfulness. Finally, we see, as we close, our compromise reveals our lack of faith 
in God. Our compromise reveals our lack of faith in God. Let's read on in chapter 1, verse 16. The descendants of the Kenites, Moses' father-in-law, went up with the people of Judah and the city of Palms into the wilderness of Judah, which lies in the Negev near Arad. And they went and settled with the people. And Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they defeated the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and devoted it to destruction. So the name of the city was called Hormah. Judah also captured Gaza with its territory and Ashkelon with its territory and Ekron with its territory. And the Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. And Hebron was given to Caleb, as Moses had said, and he drove out from it the three sons of Anak. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. The house of Joseph also went up against Bethel, and the Lord was with them. And the house of Joseph scattered out Bethel. The name of the city was formerly Lutz. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. And he showed them the way into the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the man live, the man and all his family go. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Lutz. That is its name to this day. So in verse 16, the Judahites and Simeonites, the primary army of this chapter, they continue making good headway. And after Debir, the Kenites join with them and settled with the Judahites. Or the Judahites. And there's peace. In keeping with their arrangements, the Judahites then go with the Simeonites and they attack the Canaanites at Zephath. They overrun the city and destroy it completely. All in all, there's lots of victories here. The victories are coming fast. They're coming Consistently, there's lots of joy and excitement, and they begin to settle down. And then we come to verse 19. The Lord is with them, but... And there's the first hint that all is not well. We know historically that around 1200 BC, the use of iron was being used in warfare to build chariots. And so they encounter for the first time on the the plain these iron chariots... And we either see they either tasted the first defeat or perhaps so scared were they by these iron chariots they didn't even go to war against them. Nevertheless, we know that because they're on the plain now, the chariots have the advantage. This is not going to be hand-to-hand combat. And so the Judahites could not drive out the inhabitants. The first sign of Joshua's prophecy that we looked at would come to pass. And what's very significant is they did not seem to use the same guile or cleverness that the Josephites were willing to use at the end of our little section, using a a, a spy or a Trojan horse. In verse 20, Caleb receives his inheritance. He was faithful and obedient. But then this obedience is put in between two sections. It's it's the meat of a disobedience sandwich. They did not drive out the inhabitants who had the iron chariots. And then we see the Benjaminites did not kick out the Jebusites. And rather, they were permitted to remain and reside alongside the Israelites. And the consequence is that to the day of the writing of this book, the judges, probably by Samuel Samuel, centuries later on, They're still there, imperiling the inheritance, stealing worshipers from Yahweh to their false gods. So much for their promise to heed the voice of God. Sin has begun to creep in, and the consequences we know will be be dire. Something small, almost insignificant, has gotten in, and though it will take time, this compromise will be the downfall of Israel. Sin has gotten in. These people become a snare. And Christian, for us, this this principle remains the same. Yes, we're not a nation like Israel. We're people from all over the world. Nevertheless, although the context is different, the principle is the same. We are his people, sealed by the blood of his son, and we are called, commanded by God to be obedient not for salvation, but flowing from salvation, and therefore a Christian, there must be no compromise with sin. 
No permittance of gossip, because, well, everyone does it. No justification of violence or drunkenness. No stealing or thievery when no one is watching. No lying or anger. <clears throat> Sin is a poison that gets in to the soul and corrupts everything. It corrupts our relationship with God, covering us with shame, and like Adam and Eve, causes us to hide from the one who removes our shame. It corrupts our relationships with one another, leading us to guilt and anger, pushing those who love us away. It creates a cycle of shame and guilt that draws us into ourselves and away from all others to isolation from grace and love and forgiveness. Its purpose, if it cannot kill us, is to neuter us so that we're useless in the kingdom. And it all begins with compromise. It all starts with saying, I'm willing to do this small thing because it doesn't really matter. And suddenly, the flirting leads to adultery. Anger leads to hatred. Bitterness leads to sabotage. Theft leads to violence. Lying leads to slander. Gossip leads to malice. The corrosive effects of sin, brother and sister, they are real. And they isolate us from those who love us. This is why we do confess our sins one to another, because it takes away the power of sin and shame to make us retreat, to drive us into isolation. We exhort one another to godliness, not because we're perfect, but because alone we're all weaker. We're all more vulnerable. We're all more likely to fail. We need the gospel. We need grace. We need Christ. We need the people of Christ. So Christian, do not play with sin. It will rob you of more you ever bring to the table. Put the sword of Scripture to it. Fight it. Don't compromise. By the Spirit who indwells in you, rest in His strength for obedience and fight in His strength in the temptation and taste victory. God will give you victory if you but fight and trust. Confess your sin, bring it into the light, find in that obedience, freedom, and courage, and know that victory can indeed be yours because of the mighty power of God himself. As we close, we see how a difficult enemy was to be conquered. Judah was meant to defeat the iron chariots, but he failed. But rather than giving up the house of Joseph, we see found a way, made a way to be victorious. Oh, Judah, where was your guile? Where was your coy trust in God? So, Christian, this morning, though we are talking about difficult things, graphic things, we remember that we trust the Lord for his faithfulness to us. We remember that we are to be obedient, not because of ourselves, but because of God's power. We remember that our provision rests in trusting God's faithfulness to us, and we are warned not to compromise with sin because it will weaken and damage us. But we can see how we can trust in Christ, our sovereign king, the true obedient son of Israel, the greatest child of Judah. No sin, no demon, no enemy is too great for him. He has already been victorious, and it is in him that we have the victory, the hope, the salvation of an eternal inheritance that will not fade. It is ours because of who he is and his faithfulness, and so we can rest in that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for the joy of the gospel. We praise you for the confidence that we have that you are our warrior king who fights for us, that through your son you have fought and defeated the greatest enemies our souls will ever face. And we have the hope and the life and the joy and the certainty of victory in you. We know that we will still sin in this world because sin retains a hold over our minds. But we know that we will be glorified someday when we will never taste sin again. We long for that day. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. 
Help us until that time to live in light of your present rule over your people as we taste victory and we encourage one another to experience victory for the glory of Christ's name. Amen.